you better take out a hit on someone. Because nobody ever wants to leave because it's got such a strong arts and culture sector and community. And I am proud to say that I actually found that replicated here in Chicago. So it's a good place to be an artist of any kind. I'm considering pursuing a PhD. Check back with me in five years. <laughs> um, I have a bunch of discipline that is skill specific certificates. I am currently the director of communications for U Chicago Arts and Local Center at the University of Chicago. Um, we manage promotional marketing and communications for the thing that is the arts at the University of Chicago, as well as for the Logan Center specifically. <laughs> there are two different parts of my job. We do all this in an apartment of three and a half people. So I'm telling you that because I want you to understand that what I'm showing you today, these are not things you need large crews, a lot of equipment, none of that. My team does it every day, <laughs> and I really believe that anyone else can do it too. We do it with very little budget, to be honest. So what do I do? I move minds, I heal hearts, and I secure sales with imaginative persuasion and psychological manipulation. <laughs> I want to be very clear about something, whatever. This is how my conversations go with people I've never met before. Because I don't know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I work in marketing. Oh. I work in marketing for the arts. Oh! We are not that altruistic. Just like any other marketer out there, whether they're selling sex or cigarettes or child seats, we're using the same toolbox. My objective as a marketing communications professional is to sell you something. To sell you that seat to the opera. To sell you that artist is painting or wall. To sell you on a program to help us buy violins for our after school program. It's the exact same thing. So when you leave here today, you're thinking to yourself, I'd really like to know more about this marketing communications. Don't go looking for marketing communications just in the arts and culture field. We're all doing the same thing, just with different reasons. How I do it? I provide high impact, low budget, communications, marketing, and design services to emerging mid-career creative entrepreneurs and small nonprofit arts organizations. What this translated into is that at one point I had a client who sent me an inquiry to see if I'd be interested in working on a project with them. One of the things I require when I do an intake is that you have to tell me how much your budget is for working with me. They came to me and said, we've got $15,000 for this project. And I said, no thank you, I don't want this project. I very intentionally do not take on clients that have those kinds of budgets. I have my market niche. I know exactly what my USP, my unique selling proposition is, and that's if I deliver that $15,000 price tag worth of work for a lot less than that. I do that because I have a fundamental belief that the one thing that the arts and culture sector is doing very, very wrong is the art of storytelling. I want to help small organizations build a solid foundation for how they're telling their stories, how they're talking about their brands. And then when they outgrow me, I send them off somewhere else. I was working with a Madison Youth Choir's work a number of years, even after I left Pittsburgh, they eventually grew so large they became a huge summer festival. And when they reached that point, they came back to me, you know, like, hey, it's time to do this graphic design stuff again. And I said, not with me. You're too big for me now. You've outgrown me. Here's a list of other people that you can work with. They were very sad. Yeah, I fired client. They had grown out of my preferred market. So when you're thinking about your preferred market, keep those kinds of things in mind. So why I do it? Telling stories about the arts is my vocation, it's my calling, it is my artistic practice. I don't really consider myself an artist, uh, but what I do requires a lot of the same things that being an artist requires. It requires thought. It requires me being in my studio. It requires practice, practice, practice. It requires failing and learning from that failure. And then failing at something else and learning from that failure and then having successes and forgetting about them immediately because there's so much going on and don't have time. Is what I do profitable? Yes. Pre-COVID, I was making $30,000 a year in my side business. I was working less than, actually less than 15 hours a week. And I did that by knowing exactly what my market is, what my product is that I'm offering, the clientele that I actually wanted. We are not going to go to those numbers because I honestly just haven't really restarted my business um, since COVID, because there have been, um, we lost a lot of organizations, small organizations during COVID. 
Um, a lot of my clients did have to shutter their doors. Um, some of them are hoping to come back the next year or two. So right now, I am basically just paused as our sector figures out how to recalibrate after what COVID did to us. My day job, I do have all benefits all in $90,000 a year. And I'm telling you this because that puts me in the upper quartile of arts management managers who are making any kind of money or have any kind of benefits. It took me a long time to get here. And it took me a lot of skills development to get here. Um, just an example of skills development. I know how to build websites. I know how to code. I can run a camera. I can edit audio. I'm a graphic designer. I'm a copywriter. I do it all. It's important, no matter what it is that you really want to do in life, that you have skills that are marketable in other things. Because that's the kind of stuff that gets you noticed. I mean, one of the clients I have, I have because they read an article I wrote on community engagement. I was just a piece of content that acted like brand promotion for me. So keep that in mind too. Don't just think about your visual arts as the only potential product you have. Let's see. Um, I'm telling you all this, again, for a couple of reasons. One, I feel like the bashfulness we as a sector have around pay scales is having a negative impact on all of us collectively. If we talk more about what everybody is making or what they're demanding, we might be able to get our prices across the board a little closer to each other instead of how far apart they are. Today's agenda, what we're going to do, we're going to work. There are going to be exercises. So I hope you have a pen, paper, some sort of note taking thing. If not, I have link sheets here, it's pens. So make sure you grab them. You are going to want to write down the things that I ask you to write down for your exercises. There may be controversy. I am a subject matter expert. I am not the subject matter expert. I am not the empress of marketing communications. Some of the things that I decided to talk to you about today, maybe you tried it and they don't work out. Maybe they don't feel like the correct fit for you. Maybe it conflicts with something else someone told you. That's fine. There's not really one right way to do marketing communications. The way that is right is the way that works for you. There will be jokes. At my own and others' expense, I have so many wonderful stories that I hope I can tell you as we go through today. And there will be actionable advice. My goal is that at the end of this, you leave here today with at least three things you can do immediately to support your brand and your goal for sales. Your goal for what? Sales.
So this was obviously an award-winning commercial that really sort of set the tone for what the Apple brand is. And one of the reasons I like this campaign so much is because it's essentially a focus group come to life. And the interesting thing about it is that the uh, ad company that put this together, TVWA, they did a focus group on non-Mac users, very specifically. They said, tell us what you like and don't like about whatever operating system they're using with like Linux and uh, Microsoft. And then they basically took the negative remarks from that focus group and turned it into positive branding for Apple. It's kind of shady, but it's also really kind of cool when you think about it. They basically got their competition in a room and said, tell us everything you hate about the product you can use. Okay, we're not going to do any of those things. We're going to tell you how to do better. This is really good perception branding. What this campaign has done is told us that the Mac is the hip thing to use. It is the powerhouse to use. It's the thing for creatives to use. I use both systems, and I also operate Linux as well. And honestly, they all work fine doing all the stuff I need them to do. But what matters is the perception, which is why so many of us have that Samsung and iPhone 4 going on. I'm a Samsung user, by the way. <laughs> because of our perception of those brands. Your reputation basically tells people what they can 
and should expect from you every time, all the time. Just looking at some of these people, you know what you're getting into if you're going to see a movie with Samuel L. Jackson in it. You know what we're going to be getting from Keanu Reeves, who has managed to have a second career where he is just in demand all over the place, despite, despite the fact that the first half of his career was laughable. Same with these folks. If you really want to look at how folks really do this really well, check out some of the K-pop groups. Um, probably you're all most familiar with like, BTS. They're not my favorite. I prefer NCT, Stray Kids. But check them out, because K-pop does a really, really great job of this kind of shorthand, for, especially when K-pop in many ways the music is indistinguishable from all the other music, it's popular art form. But they managed to build these huge fandoms around these artists, purely from reputation. Shorthand is profitable. If people know what they're getting from you, they know exactly what to expect when they're coming to get it from you, they are going to keep spending money with you. Eventually, you will be so popular with your brand that they will spend literally thousands of dollars to sit in the nose of these, to watch what the picture is you sitting way down. <laughs> Remember, shorthand is profitable. People have a shorthand of you, it means they have a reference, that means that you build trust. Brand is not immutable. Your brand should be willing and able to change as times change. And those times changing could be literally there's a new social consciousness around developers renting out properties they don't actually live in and how it's driven, driving up home prices and driving people out of neighborhoods. There may be. We are witnessing their going down in flames in this moment. And then you have these two. I know anyone remembers the era where Snoop Dogg was like real street, like gangland street, Martha Stewart was, you know, soccer mom, ultra. And now you see all the cooking shows getting kind with each other. It's kind of an awesome, like, brand thing that has happened. Um, especially with Snoop, because that is like, that's 180 degrees on his brand. But he still comes off as authentic because it happened so naturally. And he leaned into it. He didn't try to hold on to that street cred reputation. His world was changing. Things around him were changing. He changed with it. Very smart man. And I thought it was interesting too that her change from being coming from prison. I mean, she here was this big, uppy, uppy person. Now she's in jail. She gets in trouble, and she's like, "Is she, you know, relating to him? You know, like it's like." I thought that was a real interesting yeah. turnaround. I thought it really was. I mean, it's funny for Martha because she was understandably very angry when she went to prison. Not really because she went to prison, but she was the only one who went down for that. What happened? There were a bunch of other people who were implicated but never served in prison time, so I wonder if I could go to prison. I'd be down with gay little scoop too. <laughs> and just get all out of it. Yeah, but she's So a brand is the promise of an experience. That is what your brand is delivering. The promise of an experience. Once you deliver on that, what you're doing is you are setting expectations and meeting them. You are clearly laying out your obligations as a brand. Dolly Parton, we expect her to do wonderful things for kids. That's what's going on with her brand right now. So you expect to hear about her giving away those books and doing X and getting to charities, etc. That means that you also, because we trust that Dolly does that, we trust what her brand is doing. If she comes to us and says, can you donate $10 to give a child a pair of reading glasses, we're going to donate that ten dollars without even looking into the program because Dolly, oh goddess Dolly, yes. has said this is a cause worth giving to. So think about that too as you build a brand. All right, so next exercise: write three to six um, adjectives, positive or negative, and please be honest with yourselves that describe your brand perception. It could be the brand as it actually is now, or the brand you would eventually hope to have. Um, this is a <laughs> creepy pro tip. One of the easiest ways to do a self-branding exercise is to write your own eulogy. It tells you a lot of things about who you are, who you actually are, who you 
think you are who you wish you had been before life. So do that exercise with your own time. But can you repeat that? Yeah. Which part? I'll write your own eulogy. Who you are. Yeah. yeah. Who you are. Who you think you are. Who you actually are. And who you wish you were when you were still alive. Another 10 seconds on this exercise. And remember, honesty. Be honest with yourself. Silence is doing lots of stuff that may or 
about the environment was here's some powerful rushing water and people planting trees. Our policies could be related to these bad wagon views that cost a great deal. In today's high speed environment, stop motion footage of a city at night with cars turning quickly makes you think about doing things efficiently and time passing.
you know, and think about your own product lines within your brand. Maybe you have an $11 piece of artwork. Maybe you have a $7,000 piece of artwork. And you're going to tell the stories about these differently. Yes? I just have an image that I saw on TV the other day. Uh, a commercial for a walk-in fancy closet with all the built-in. And the tagline was, you'll know you've arrived. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, what, have my shoes? <laughs> 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 like, where have I arrived? Because it's so stupid. <laughs> You're not the clientele for that. But there is someone, <laughs> there is someone out there who is dreaming of a day where they are gainfully employed enough to afford a walk-in and they will pay $12,000 to realize that dream of themselves. So yes, brand is the sum total of how someone perceives a particular organization. Branding is about shaping that perception. All right, so I wonder how you draft a slogan for your brand. I'm not going to give you three minutes if you need to get going, but I want you to draft a slogan. And remember, maybe you're a high end luxury brand. You don't do slogans. Just think for a moment. You want to write a slogan for yourself. Just draft something away from us. Drop it off. Yeah, back at me. I have. Is it worse still? Two tickets 
is that thing you love for the day. The tickets are now dark. Anything's possible when your man smells like Old Spice and other things. I don't know. I love it. I have all 15 of this campaign's videos in my cloud, and I watch them just for fun. <laughs> I love this campaign because it does everything perfectly. It tells a story about itself. It's a brand that's going to make you sexually appealing. It sells a concept to the men watching about the men they probably want to be. I want to be sexually attractive. I want to be able to attract women. <coughs> Obviously, I need this product. It sells to the women who are watching. Yeah, you know, my man doesn't do any of that. I'm gonna get this body wash. It's just, it's just such a wonderful campaign. Every part of it. I absolutely love it. If you study no other campaign, please study this one. As a function of marketing storytelling, it is the long to see. But I recognize in what she's left out, 
the strengths that she's trying to tell in her story. Even if I was not familiar with Alicia Bentley yet, who praised her so long, it has been amazing watching her go from an artist who caught a lot of flack because she's a black woman who works mostly in Japanese animation styles. It was a rough world for her to be trying to work in. And she, years and years and years she tried, but she found that too and she realized what the real strengths were. And then from that, she also started doing what she wanted to do as an artist. She stopped trying to adjust herself to other people's expectations, and she set her own expectations for her brand. She had followed her. That is translated into some wonderful content that she puts out. Um, she runs a podcast where she talks to other visual artists and tattooists in Nashville and elsewhere. Um, she has a newsletter. Her newsletter is really long. I learned a lot of cool stuff from her newsletter. You know, she, put, she does photo shoots like this in her shop. It's like, you know, who she is and what she's about. This is the kind of content you're going to want to be producing. Because when you think about marketing, what you're actually talking about is content. Content marketing is the way things are sold today. And here's an exercise I do. 
something interesting for you to do. Consider an artist from the past, one that has passed away. If they were alive today and you were creating a brand for them, what would that look like? It's always a good exercise I found to really get yourself into the mindset when, you're, uh, when you can objectively apply this to somebody else. And don't rush. Again, marathon, not a sprint. You're going to get things wrong, it's okay. Just course correct. You're going to try something that's not going to work, it's okay. Just course correct. Just don't rush. We are in your time. Any real quick questions?